So you've been in this business for a while, and you have True. been an advocate and an activist inside government, outside of government. Give us some big picture perspective before I ask you about USAID itself. Where do you think we are? are? Are we in a new era? What does it mean? What does it look like to you? You know, hopefully, we're always in a new era. And I think what I would describe as new and different about this moment, one, there's a much richer menu of options for how countries or communities might want to perceive their development goals. And it's more accessible. With the internet and travel, people are able to see what other communities and countries have done. That's a great thing. There's a much more diverse array of partners, and there are many more tools at hand. So I think there is a richness to the moment we're in that is extremely valuable. I think at the same time, <clears throat> what we would have called a complex political emergency back when I was in the field would be a piece of cake today. Yeah. So the flip side, I know somebody was just talking about Ebola. When you think of chronic conflicts and how complex they are, and the duration, and when you look at transnational threats, whether it's climate, epidemics, whatever else it may be, yeah. the complexity of the downside is much greater than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, you're right. I mean, this is a complex world. Look at the, even just the SDGs. Yeah. And they themselves are complex. And a lot of people would say to me, we don't, why do we want this complexity? And I would say, this is just reality, right? This is the, yeah, the world reality is complex. of the world we're in. The world is complex. And I'm, I'm always the glass half full or three quarters full. So I think what we have on the positive side will yeah. ultimately prevail. But in terms of, as I say, when I look around the world at some of the challenges, what are the toughest development challenges that we face, uh, we can't underestimate how hard those are. So we need like really good, smart thinking brains to be working on these. Yeah, and I think that tent has gotten bigger. A lot of those folks are represented yeah. here today. I want to know, at USAID, you've been moving things. You've been there not that long, but before then you were at the National Security Council, Senior Director for, for Global Development in the Obama administration. Right. So you're not new to this administration or this strategy. Uh, how is USAID itself shifting? How are you moving it in this new era? I, I think there are a few things. One of the things about which I am very proud is there was a decision taken early on by the Obama administration to elevate development and strengthen and elevate USAID. Uh, I think that's the right thing to do for a lot of reasons, but I think when you think about all the solutions that development offers, it's also the smart thing to do. So the first thing I would say is aid is much stronger than it was seven years ago. Uh, the second is it's got a lot more recognition. I think it's got a seat at the table. Uh, it is called within on... The within, within the government. Within the government and the policy-making process, aid is at the table, that development perspective is part of the mix. Uh, I, I, some of the new things that are happening at AID, uh, a serious upgrade and revamp of how we do evaluations and that we publish evaluations and that we're doing a lot more with data and evidence, which was part of what the president directed when he signed the first ever policy directive on development. I mean, the agency was created in 1961. 2010, we had the first articulated policy. You had some role in that. Uh, I, I did. <laughs> I did. And uh, it was a way to, I think, focus, focus the mind. So where do you think it goes from here? I mean, you, there's not much time. I think Ben Rhodes said seven months left in the Obama administration. But you know, what do you, what's the mark you want to leave on this agency? I, I think there are a couple things. I think we want to do as much as we can to capture what the successes have been Development is importantly a discipline. It's an aspiration, but it's also a discipline. And so making the case, I mean, there are a lot of you and a lot of people watching and listening, and that's great, but there's still a lot of people we have to persuade that this stuff actually works yeah. and is worth investments of time, energy, and money. So marshalling the evidence to show that we've got real sustainable outcomes. Institutionalizing what works, but also I think preparing for something we're gonna see over the next 10 years which we all talk about ownership. It's really important, country ownership. People should own their own development. Uh, I think we all believe that. I think we've seen a lot of that. I think that's gonna intensify dramatically over the coming years. And that, in turn, is gonna change the role of USAID, uh, of yeah. government donors, of international NGOs. I think that's gonna be a good thing, but I think it's gonna be the next 
iteration the next wave. What if, of what is constant change. It's a lot easier to talk about country ownership than to actually do it, right? And I think everybody's found this right. out, including big institutions, many in this room, not just government, all kinds of institutions. But it turns out that actually if you do evaluations and if you take a look at what works and what doesn't, there is a body of evidence that makes clear it's not just an assertion that, of course, in principle, people should be the masters of their own fate. Who doesn't believe that? They're probably not here if they do. But to be able to show from an evidentiary basis that you get a different outcome when people actually own the process and the tools and are defining the solutions, that makes a difference. The more we can start a conversation by saying what we know is X, the more able we are to make the case for the time, attention, and resources we need to get to the big challenge, which is scale. One of the things we're about to hear from the panel that's going to come out is the issue of human-centered design. Like, you know, how do we get to a point where we're thinking about the people impacted themselves? I'm thinking about this from the country ownership mm -hmm. lens, designing their own solutions. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to do that in the way government works and agencies like USAID work because you've got to answer to the U.S. Congress and... How, how do you think these kind of new models for the way we des develop solutions can be integrated in the way government works? You know, I, I don't think it's as hard as it seems. And I will tell you, my experience with Congress is that if we are transparent and we bring evidence to bear when things are working, but also when things aren't, that's what buys us the confidence and trust of Congress, I think. Uh, if you look at something like food security, that's an initiative that was built on a foundation that was agreed by African leaders. We didn't start that. The ownership of that was a commitment by leaders to increase spending on agriculture and that every country should have a plan. And they had a sense of what a plan should be. We built on that. So that was owned from the beginning. A lot of the work that we do with our partners and particularly the NGO community are owned by those communities. So it's less the, well, if we give up power or agency in somehow, in some way, will right. have a, a problem. I think more showing that we get an outcome that's sustainable, people are going to spend a lot less time saying, how did you get there? If you can show it works, how you got there matters a whole lot less. Well, what about looking the other way? You know, when you think about the partners, USAID partners with, what would you like to, what, what would your message be to them? Many, many folks who are in this room, the NGO community or social entrepreneurs or corporations or any of the new flavor of organizations out there, what should they be thinking of or doing differently uh, in, from your perspective in this new era? I mean, I don't know that, whether this is something I would say people should do differently, but I think the opportunity we have is really scale. And I think identifying a couple of areas where if people come together uh, and really map out a more deliberate path to say we're going to get from here to there and focus. Because part of the challenge on development is it's everything, right? So when we first did the policy directive and I asked everybody, what is our development policy and goal? We had 43. Not terribly efficient. If we focused and said we are going to get to the end game on health around the world, we could do it. We could do it on education. We could do it on food security. Getting to really, really big scale is what I think we should do next. Identify a couple areas and go for broke. That's a great call to action. If you look at our logo on the door here when you come into this hall, it's Converge, Exchange, Inspire. What keeps you inspired? I mean, you've got to fight against all kinds of strictures in your job. There's lots of, you know, lots of challenges in being USAID administrator. I'm sure it's a great job and one you love, but what keeps you inspired when you, when you get into these situation room meetings and hear about these seemingly intractable challenges that you can leave us with as a message today? I, I, think I'll, um, I think on the positive side, look, when your job is to get up in the morning and go figure out how on behalf of your government you can make the world a better place, it's kind of the best job in government. But the other thing that drives me, in, and I've thought about this a lot, I've seen a lot of what happens when development doesn't work, hmm. and I don't want to see that again. And so, I mean, I... I you know, you're supposed to talk about, I met this woman in a village and she's inspired me yeah. forever. I've met thousands of those people and mm -hmm. they inspire me. But I think the thing that drives me is seeing where the world has failed. And what happens where we fail is people die. So that's not on. So quite frankly, it's pretty easy when you think about the consequences of failure or going at something halfway yeah. or not saying what needs to be said. 
it makes it pretty easy to go ahead and do it. 